I'm Suzanne and I'm a horticulturist here at Rogers Gardens. Uh, thank you for coming to our Instagram and Facebook live series. Uh, we're going to be putting these talks on our YouTube channel as well. So uh, don't worry if you've missed some of the information earlier in this talk. If you're uh, kind of floating in and out of it, it's not a problem. We're always going to have them on our YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about creating a pollinator garden. And um, this is a subject that is just near and dear to my heart. I'm just, um, I'm building a pollinator garden uh, at my house and I'm super excited to see it growing and uh, learning more and more about how to really attract the pollinators. Um, one of the things that you wanna do when you're creating a pollinator garden is think about who you want to invite in. Um, when you create this garden, a lot of people right now are really um, super excited to plant milkweed for their monarchs. And, and monarchs are great and monarchs are in trouble, so of course we want to help them along. But there are a lot of other pollinators that benefit all of humankind in so many other ways. So let's um, focus on uh, some other things this morning. We do have our milkweed here planted in our big... Uh, this is our... Uh, bird and butterfly pollinator garden here at Rogers. Uh, James Maxwell, one of our horticulturists here, created this and it is so beautiful. It has a water element up there, which is important. It has lots of native grasses and it has lots of beautiful flowers that are going to be um, working throughout the year. And that's, um, that's an important thing that we want to look at. Um, not just springtime, not just summertime, not just fall, not just winter. We want to have a habitat for the uh, pollinators year round. And so uh, this is going to include, of course, milkweed, which is a host plant for monarchs. Uh, the monarchs will lay their eggs on the plant and the eggs will hatch and the, uh, the caterpillars will eat the plant. Um, it will flower at some point, a uh, little bit later on in the season. We have ours here and I can see little flowers forming, but they're not quite ready yet. The butterflies, of course, will take some uh, nourishment from those plants, but they also like to get their food, uh, kind of their energy from other plants. Things like this, um, this yarrow or achillea. This is planted behind me. You can this grassy looking um, plant, but when it blooms, it'll get flowers like this and it comes in a multitude of colors. There's yellow, there's white, there's this beautiful rusty red. Um, but these are a great food source for a ton of pollinators, not just your monarchs, but lots of butterflies and everything. So we have those. We have lantana, which is a great plant. The lantana of your grandma's time, that was a big giant hedge that you couldn't control, um, has made way for these beautiful new hybrids that are much smaller, much easier to have in an ordinary garden and come in so many beautiful colors. You're gonna have a lot of flowers throughout the year. So it's kind of neat. You can have white, purple, these beautiful uh, red transitioning ones, yellow. And um, so just uh, keep in mind, you can have some plants that will have color year round, but um, a lot of times we're gonna have spring flowers, summer flowers, fall things, and winter things to help keep the pollinators coming year round. Um, this is a native plant. Uh, this is Ceanothus. And so discussing native plants, the best plants to put in your garden for pollinators are native plants. Um, there are so many beautiful things that you can plant with the native plants. And if you're not really a fan of something not having a lot of interest all the year, you can kind of place them in little uh, spots in your garden to keep the interest of the pollinators. Um, this Ceanothus is a beautiful plant. It has shiny green leaves. Some of them are round, some of them are a little bit more oval, but these beautiful, beautiful blue flowers come out in spring and the bees love them and lots of other pollinators as well. So um, this is just a great plant and it comes in all different varieties from ground cover, which will only get about one to two feet tall, up to big trees. The Ray Hartman variety is just a gorgeous, gorgeous tree, and it grows really quickly. So you can have this beautiful kind of uh, wild looking tree in your garden that's going to provide these beautiful flowers and also a home for birds and things like that. When you're thinking of a pollinator garden, you want to think about habitat. 
So having beautiful shrubs like manzanitas or the ceanothus, some of the, um, the, uh, the roots and the other beautiful coffee berry plants that are California natives, those provide a home for the birds. They can nest in it. They can nest in oak trees if you put them in your gardens. So um, think of it as a, a full circle thing, not just food for one a particular insect or pollinator, but a whole natural habitat. And that's kind of the cool thing because when you're, when you're looking at something like a native grass, and this isn't too big right now, but it will get nice and big and fluffy. This is a Festuca californica hybrid, and it, um, it's gonna get about maybe two to three feet tall. But the beautiful thing about this is that it's a beautiful grass that's gonna give you that movement in your garden. But these seeds up here are gonna be food for birds. And so uh, one of the beautiful things is that you can let it just kind of, let it ride through the winter, keep those seeds on there and you'll be providing food for birds in the winter as well. And the, you know, the fall and winter. That being said, <laughs> um, there is a, a situation right now, I read this article in the, um, LA Times recently about bird feeders and although they are great and they are fun and they create a lot of activity for you to watch and to help uh, feed a lot of the birds that are pollinators in our area, um, there is a salmonella issue and uh, birds are contracting salmonella and dying so that's kind of a problem and that is created with bird feeders because the birds all converge there, they might do a little poop and then it will spread from bird to bird. So. Um, if you can, try and cut back on the bird feeders for the moment until the salmonella issue is over and utilize um, beautiful foods like these uh, grasses that have so many gorgeous seeds on them. This, um, this Cesslaria autumnalis, I mean, it is just gorgeous and it, it would kind of be at home at any garden because it's very pretty, it's very well behaved, it has these beautiful seed pods and it provides a lot of movement in the garden. So, you know, anything, you could put this in an English garden, in a more uh, kind of rustic Arroyo Seiko kind of situation as well. But um, make sure that you leave the seeds on there. Although a lot of times, if you want, you can cut them back in November and have them come out fresh again. Uh, but just know that grasses are great for, uh, for the birds, native grasses. Um, one other thing, when you have a native garden, you want to have a water element. And this is kind of fun because you can have something like a fountain. Um, if it has somewhat of a flat surface, birds can land on it. They can uh, have a great time with it, hummingbirds. Even if there's a kind of a shallow enough area, you can have butterflies land on it for, um, for a little water and also the bees will do it. But one of the uh, funnest things that you and maybe your children can have a project with is creating a butterfly and bee feeder. This is just a little saucer here from Rogers. And I have some, some rocks that I gathered from around here and some pebbles. And this is shallow enough that bees or butterflies will not kind of uh, drown in your water that a, a deeper bird bath might uh, create for them. They won't go there if the water is too deep. So this is kind of fun and you can just go out every day and check on it and give it fresh water. Be really fun for kids to keep an eye on and then they can watch it to see what comes there to, um, to feed. So um, another thing I want to mention is that you don't need to have a huge area to have a pollinator attracting garden. Um, if you have, for example, maybe a patio where it's um, a little shadier, maybe you think that, you know, you can't get uh, pollinators to come. This is a plant called Rucellia, and it has these beautiful red flowers. This plant will get pretty big, so you can put it in a nice tall pot. It will hang down. It will have hundreds of these beautiful red flowers there, and you will have every hummingbird in the neighborhood at your house trying to uh, go for these flowers. They just love them and they will find them. So it's also a pretty plant, um, you know, kind of contemporary. And if you have a couple, it would be just a really nice um, setup on a, um, 
like a patio, a balcony, anything like that. So um, we've talked a little about, you know, creating a habitat, planting the right plants, which would be natives. Of course, you can put other uh, plants in there, but the best food for our native our native bees, our native birds, our butterflies and everything like that are native plants because that's where they get the best food. And um, you don't have to worry too much about does this plant have um, the, right, the right ingredients for it. We have some beautiful, beautiful sunflowers here. They're called Sun Believable, but actually they don't really have any pollen to attract any animals. So if you do have some sort of aversion to bees, you could actually plant those Sun Believables. But they would not be a good plant in a pollinator garden because they just, they have no attraction to the, the pollinators. And then maintenance, the best way to maintain a beautiful native garden like this is to not do anything. So how easy is that? You can cut it back a little bit at the very, very end of November to get a little order in there, but leaving these plants to do as they like and grow as they do normally out in the situations that they do, it's easy. And, and it really just will bring so many animals to your garden. It's really fun to see what you can attract during the different times of the year, whether it's uh, wrens and juncos at this time of the year. We have bluebirds, we have hummingbirds most of the year here because of our beautiful climate. Then you'll have different kinds of bees. You'll have maybe carpenter bees and you'll have, um, you know, the beautiful honeybees as well as the native bees. We have 1500 native bees in California. None of them are the honeybee. They're just, if you ever see a bee and you go, wow, I know that's a bee, but like, what kind of bee is it? It's probably a native bee. It's, they are here everywhere and they just, um, they look a little different. So that's kind of fun from big bees to small bees. And, um, I just hope you can find a little spot in your garden for a pollinator place. It's, it's really, really fun to watch them. And so with that, I'm going to see if we have any questions. Yes. And we might. <laughs> yeah, we do. We have a number of questions. Okay. So the first is, someone's asked, can you plant ceanothus in the large pot? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, the great thing is, is that it doesn't require a ton of water once it gets established, maybe once every week or every two weeks. It's, uh, it's a great plant and it's very sculptural. So you can find a, a Ceanothus variety that suits you, whether it's that ground cover, um, what's it called? Uh, oh my gosh, I've just lost my mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, there are some ground cover ones. They will creep beautifully out of a pot or you can put like a nice shrub one that you can train into a beautiful uh, little tree in there. Awesome, thank you. You sort of answered the next question we have. Someone's asked, is there a ground cover that works well to attract butterflies? Yes, um, so some of the ground covers, especially this Achillea, I don't know if you can see it right there in back of we me. We can, yes. Um, that is such a great ground cover. Uh, the variety that we have planted here is called Sonoma Coast and we haven't gotten that in yet this season. But this one here also kind of mimics that, that thing. A lot of the yarrows or Achilleas, they have this green at the bottom, but that Sonoma Coast is a great one. You can even walk on it and it smells kind of pretty and it's very earthy and beautiful. And it's, it's really nice. These flowers are just gorgeous. This one's called Desert Eat Red. And this uh, series has a couple of different colors, but it's, it's just a gorgeous soft plant. Awesome, thank you, Suzanne. So that red plant that you showed us that attracts hummingbirds, a lot of people are asking about it. Can you give us the name? So this is Rucellia. It's also called um, firecracker plant, but there are a lot of plants, especially, just to let you know, this is also called firecracker plant, which is also a good pollinator plant. Hummingbirds love this. This is Kufia, this is Rucellia. This is better for shade, this one's better for sun. So, um, Rucellia will get really, really big. If you come to Rogers and you pull in the farmhouse driveway, you will see Rucellia planted on the right-hand side. It is, um, it's, it's a great, great plant. And this is the first, this little plant here is part of the first um, group of plants that we got here this season so far. So we'll be carrying it throughout the summer, but right now um, we don't have a ton. I, I would say we probably have about 10 in stock right now. 
Awesome, thank you. And so for the Ruselia, uh-huh. it, someone also asked what would it look like when, you know, over time, which you've answered, but I just wanted to quickly inform that that inform them that if you go to our website on the plant finder feature. Oh yeah. You want to tell us about no, you're that? Telling. <laughs> but yeah, so on our website we have a plant finder feature where you can look up whichever plant you desire and you can gain all the information about them and you can see pictures of what they would look like over time. So check that out on our website. So I'll go to the next question here. Someone has asked, what plants are best for small flower planters in front of my window ledge? Do you have suggestions for that? Sure, and it depends on if it's sun or shade. Um, Always if it's afternoon sun, morning shade, it's considered a full sun area. And if it's the opposite, then it's a, a partial. But I did bring this. Um, there are a lot of tall plants. It just depends. You can do the, the Rogers method of thriller, filler, spiller. That is going to be great with um, pollinator plants. So this is called a butterfly bush. It's Budlea. And this comes in whites and pinks and purples and dark purples, pale purples. Um, it is a great plant. I brought this one. It doesn't look quite as beautiful as it will when it's a little bit bigger. It'll be really nice and full and kind of a nice big round plant but this um this flower right here is a great food source for all butterflies it's really nice to see them in the summer they love 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 this plant so you could put this in the middle that would be a lot of fun or you could do another one of the kufias this is a in my backyard i have two of these and this is a hummingbird attractor like crazy um all of the kufias so this um this orange one here, I mean, can you imagine just this in a pot? This would be gorgeous. And, but we have the pink, we have the orange, something kind of for everyone. And um, if you did, for example, this beautiful little pink one, you could put this on the edge to creep out. This is catmint. So um, catmint is a great plant if you have cats, but it's also a really good pollinator attractor. Look at those beautiful flowers. And you can do something like that. And of course, one of the one of the most fun and famous pollinator attractors, uh, bees love this plant, is lavender. Um, if you have a nice sunny spot, lavender is such a great bee attractor. Um, so you could put this in the center of a pot and add some beautiful color down uh down in the front and it would be great just uh, beautiful fantastic thank you suzanne so another question here this one's a good one it says are there any plants that are that can be for both sun and shade to attract insects and birds it depends and that's, it's a super specific question it really just depends on how much uh so again afternoon sun is the hottest sun of the day so you can do like a partial a partial sun kind of situation, but you really need to know when do you have that really hot sun Mm -hmm. and where do you live? You know, at the coast, we have kind of our own rules down here because it's so moderate. But as you move inland, that afternoon sun can be really, really hot. And so if you have two hours of afternoon sun, as you go maybe 10 or 15 miles in, um, it's a lot different than six, six to eight hours of afternoon sun. Um, So it's a little bit specific. We can call the store. We'll talk to you. Sounds good. Thank you. (laughs) Or come by the store. (laughs) So back to the lavender. Does it need a lot of water? Lavender does not. Um, It it likes a little water to get established. And then you're just going to be keeping it on the dry side. Let it dry out in between. It really likes super good drainage. And it likes to dry out in between. So that's awesome thank you and so another question here what is a good pollinator for a vegetable garden oh gosh that's a great one uh, actual vegetables or i'm gonna say an herb garden i brought my favorite and unfortunately we only have super tiny tiny versions of this right now this is my all-time favorite pollinator uh, this is african blue basil this plant will get about three feet tall and it will have tons of flowers all over the top. This, this basil can be eaten if you like, but for me, I just keep it to attract the bees in my garden. I love it. Um, you can pull up a chair and sit right next to this and watch 
literally hundreds of bees coming and going all day long. Once they discover this plant, it becomes a huge part of your garden of just watching so many bees just come and go. It is amazing and there is no better pollinator. Even lavender kind of pales in comparison to this African blue basil, which is not a native, but for bees, it's a great source of uh, pollen and nectar. Fantastic, thank you, Suzanne. So to touch on the small water feature that you have there, mm -hmm. someone said, I'm concerned about mosquitoes in the summer. I put out rock, excuse me, I put out rock and water saucers for bees and birds, but am I also attracting mosquitoes? Um, maybe. Um, it's good to clean them all the time. Um, and then, then this goes into all the different kinds of mosquitoes that we have now. They are really getting kind of bad. Last summer was horrible for mosquitoes, but it, it, you have to work on what kind of mosquito you have. There are, um, there are drops that you can put in the water. Uh, it's like a fountain drop that will help with that sort of thing. But the best thing to do is to clean it regularly. Um, the uh, Egyptian uh, mosquitoes, the Aedes, those are a particularly bad uh, form. They will fly during the day. They will lay their eggs uh, kind of like, um, most mosquitoes, you will see their little larva hanging out in the middle here. They can float. And once you uh, clean out the water, then the mosquitoes um, are dead. But the Aedes, they will lay their eggs on the side here where, and they'll stick them there. And if the water goes down, they'll still be fine. And so that's, you gotta scrub the areas. So again, keeping it clean, uh, not letting it just be a stagnant thing is, is really important. Um, if you have plants or f uh, example like bromeliads, I love having bromeliads, but they do have water inside of them. You can use a BT spray on them and that will help with mosquitoes. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all the helpful info, Suzanne. That's it for questions. I've got one more. Yes. I thought somebody would <laughs> ask me, so I was kind of waiting. I was just waiting because somebody said, oh, what about succulents? You know, what if you want to have a succulent pollinator oh, garden? Oh, go for it. So I brought my friend, Mr. Allo, here. <laughs> and I just want to say, although, again, they don't bloom all year. They give a good bloom in the spring. A lot of succulents, uh, succulent flowers, the... Um, the pollinators love, especially hummingbirds and bees. If you have those beautiful dinner plate aeoniums in your garden and you see them suddenly start to sprout that spike of flowers, sometimes people will chop them off, but I always say just leave it there until it, it, you know, it can get this tall. It'll have beautiful yellow flowers on it. The bees will go crazy. And then after the bees abandon it, then chop it off because that is just a great thing. So the, again, hummingbirds and bees love succulent flowers so don't count those out awesome thank you suzanne we have a promotion that ends today do you want to tell right. us about it so um in in honor of um earth day that was last week uh we have a buy a native plant and you'll get 25 percent off we'll also donate 25 percent of the sale to the california native plant society that sale ends today, so uh, take advantage of all these beautiful, beautiful plants. We have the native buckwheats. We have um, a, just a ton of beautiful pollinator natives for you here. So anyway, that's it for me today. Don't forget, Sarah will be here on Thursday for her talk. Um, I don't know what she's talking about this week. Do you, Bimmy? I'd have to look at the list, but you won't want to miss it either way. You won't want to miss it because Sarah's fascinating. Everybody loves her. So um, anyway, that's it for me. Don't forget to go to rogersgardens.com, shop online or shop in the store. We have our Facebook, our Instagram, and our YouTube channels. Okay, we'll see you next time.